Good uh, morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, as Tom said, uh, my name is Matthijs Leenertse. I'm really happy that Tom is also a native Dutch speaker because my name is quite difficult if you're not Dutch. Uh, I always love it when I go to London. I go there quite often and then I go at Starbucks and then I say, well, what's your name? I say, it's Matthijs. And I always love to see what they come up with and I take pictures of it and share it, of course, on Facebook. <laughs> I always think that's one of the fun things. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you a bit about media innovation. That's sort of my, my topic and also my, my area of expertise. Um, I'm focused a lot also on how media innovation can change education. So I will talk about that a bit as well. And, and I have to be a bit humble about this. I will also discuss my thoughts on uh, the, the archives. But of course, I'm not an archive specialist, but I can perhaps from my domain give some suggestions or some observations. So I leave that a bit up to you. But what I wanted to start with is that if you look at media, and I find it always a really fascinating debate, is that we sort of live in what I call the cult of the new. Um, there's always something new that's being launched. There's always a product development that is sort of being heralded in all the newspapers. And everything is a revolution and everything is fantastic. And uh, what I always like to do with my students is really to challenge, is it actually new? And what is the newness of what we see? Um, I just did a little Google search yesterday. I thought, like, what will happen if I type in media revolution? And you get over 70 million hits. That's quite a lot. I think if I look at the papers that my students have to write for me, uh, I think probably half of them will start with a sentence like, the media has been revolutionally different now than it was 10 years ago. And of course, there's some truth in it, but it's really worthwhile to consider what is new and what isn't new. Um, because one of the things what often happens is that we have new technology, but we are stuck in what we call the horseless carriage syndrome. Um, if you look at this, this was the beginning of the automobiles. And what people didn't really think of, they thought of like, it's just a carriage without horses. So what we do is we build carriages without horses. So if you look at sort of the whole design of the cars in the early days, it was basically a carriage. And if I see it now, I really think like, oh, where are the horses? Can this actually drive? But no one was thinking about aerodynamics or perhaps you could have some shelter for the rain, etc. Because we couldn't think of the new technology in its own right. We always think initially of all technology of what we already know. So what you see is often, especially with online and digital developments, at the start, people tend to do the exact same thing as they used to do. So it's television on the internet. It's a book, but then we digitize it and we turn it into a PDF and then, you know, we're really innovative. Um, you see always in a few years, a little bit down the line, that things change. And sometimes, and it's also, I think, always good to consider, I always love my, my uh, colleagues from the history department, um, to consider is perhaps sometimes we're moving back. Because, for instance, if you look at e-learning, this is, uh, I think, a really interesting observation uh, by, by Barbara Stafford. She says that with the increasingly widespread use of interactive computer graphics and educational software, we are basically returning to a kind of oral visual culture that was at the heart of European education and scientific experiment in the early 18th century. So, basically, a lot of times things sometimes also go back and we have to also consider that. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to talk about media innovation, of course, and also a little bit about what is innovation and is it, for instance, different from an invention. Um, then I would like to talk about some of the drivers for media innovation as I see them, not so much from a uh, technological point of view, but more from perhaps a, a human and business point of view. And then these drivers, I'm also going to apply them to the education uh, uh, sector, because there's a lot of innovation happening because of media developments. And I'd like to end with some thoughts for archives. So that's sort of uh, uh, my presentation for the day. So let me start with the first part. Um, if, we, if we think about new things, there I think is a really clear distinction between what we call an invention and an innovation. And I think it's really worthwhile to sort of make the conceptual distinction because if you look at an invention, that's really what we call a new idea or a theoretical model. And this is basically what a lot of universities are really good at. You know, trying to come up with really fundamental research, coming up with new ideas. But as most of you will probably know, having an idea doesn't mean that the idea is also used. So that's where innovation comes into play. An innovation is basically introducing something new to the socio-economic system. 
So you can have an idea, and um, I go to a lot of academic conferences, and there are a lot of people with a lot of ideas that never materialize in the real, real world, because that's often what companies do or public organizations do. So innovation means that you actually introduce it so that people can use it, that it has an impact. And that distinction is really important, I think, because then you don't think about innovation as something that has to do with basically having a new idea, what a lot of people always say, like, oh, Apple has a lot of new ideas. Well, actually, if you look at the iPad, which was introduced in 2010, eight years before, Bill Gates had sort of a similar picture as you see here with Steve Jobs, where he was basically introducing the tablet PC. It also says, I don't know if you can read it, but the tablet PC is super cool. Uh, which, of course, you should never say, I think, from a marketing perspective, because then, of course, it isn't cool. Um, but what happened? What was the difference? Why was Apple successful with the iPad? And everybody thought Apple was super innovative, because they were innovative, because they brought it successfully to the socio-economic system. So basically, they knew what would drive users. They knew how to build an ecosystem around the product, uh, whereas Microsoft perhaps pushed it a bit too much from a technological point of view. Um, but if you think about it, Apple, of course, wasn't the one with the first idea to introduce a tablet to the masses. That has happened before. But they inno innovated from a different perspective. So that's worthwhile to think that uh, execution is key. So if you go a bit further and look at innovation, you can say innovation is not just bringing something totally new, but you can also make a combination of what we already know. You know, there's a lot of knowledge out there. If you combine it, and perhaps with new resources, you can create new business opportunities and perhaps also future innovations. And therefore, you set sort of uh, uh, the stage for continuing change. And again, if you go back to the iPad, I think that is what Apple did. Because a lot of the technology was out there. They, of course, had the iPhone with the whole apps e ecosystem. They looked, of course, also probably at what Microsoft did. A lot of people were thinking about it. And they combined a lot of these resources and created a product that people actually liked. So for Apple, that was a huge business opportunity, of course. I mean, if you see how much money they made with that. Um, but also what they did is that they, of course, um, allowed all these people to create all these cool apps and also have business opportunities for themselves. So this is a picture of the hipsters. You probably know them with the dark glasses and they look all cool and I always feel really outdated when I talk to them. Um, there are a few companies around here, actually creative companies, where you can see uh, quite a few of them that make a lot of apps. So therefore we have wonderful things. This is uh, from, from Finland, uh, Clash of Clans, which was a really popular game on uh, iOS devices. But you see basically that Apple also created continuing change in other industries and allowed others to also pursue business opportunities. So in that sense, that's really what innovation is all about. It's not so much about having the first light bulb moment and the first idea, but successfully bringing it to markets, to consumers, to the public sector. So that's a good one. So if you think about media innovation, and there are lots of different angles you can take, um, but if you think about it, and if you look at sort of what drives media innovation, I think there are four main drivers currently that have a huge impact on, on how the media is changing. And the first, of course, is the connected, empowered user. I just took this picture because I was explaining to my niece, who's 10 years old, I was explaining to her that when I was in school, we couldn't text each other. And really took her five minutes to grasp the whole concept that we couldn't text each other. She was like, huh? So how did you contact each other? It's like, well, you could call someone's house and then the mother would pick up and then you say, hello, mother of so-and-so, can I please talk to so-and-so? And she's like, but what if you weren't there? Well, you have to try it again, perhaps later. It was really in sort of an alien concept. And yeah. And I find that really, really interesting because also if I look at my students, uh, they're so connected and uh, they are so different in how they consume media. For them, linear media, such as watching a TV channel, is not really an option anymore. I think 95% of my students don't have a TV. And that is quite different because I think if I, I've been teaching now for 12 years, so 10 years ago, most of them would still have a TV subscription. And now it's just, yeah, I don't need it. And we have international students who so say, oh, I just download all my stuff from Germany, or I watch some online uh, streams, etc." cetera. Um, so they're really empowered because they have access to so much information, and they can decide for themselves what they want and what they don't want to access. Um, it's the same, one of the things that I find 
very interesting is that even, even as a teacher, you say to students, you have to read these 20 articles and you have to download them via the digital library. None of them uses the search function of the digital library, literally none. If they can't find it in Google Scholar, they're gonna email me, say, can you please email me the article? And I will put it on the Facebook group of my fellow students because every course before it starts has a Facebook group. We're not involved, the teacher cannot look, of course, what's going on there. But they discuss things with each other before they ask me a question. It's really, really intriguing. So they're super connected and they're super empowered. And of course, it has a huge consequence for media companies because it means there's a whole new way of looking at your consumers. Because in the old days, you would just come home after a day work, you want to see the news, well, you have to switch it on at 8 o'clock if you want to see the news, because the news is at 8 o'clock. And then, of course, you're going to watch a soap series or a movie, etc. But it was so much more controlled by the media companies, and now we have a lot of empowered users that are hyper-connected. And to stick with the theme of being connected, the second uh, driver, and I think that is something that uh, perhaps a lot of you also know, is the whole idea of network effects. This is an image uh, uh, from uh, Snapchat. Does anybody here use Snapchat? Yeah, you use it? Do you like it? So-so? Yeah. I always wonder, because I was always... I, I, that's one of the nice things if you spend a lot of time with a lot of young people, of course, because then they also come up with all these new things that they use. And Snapchat is now all the rage, so everybody is Snapchatting all the time. And I still don't really understand it, but I think because I downloaded it on my phone, and I have literally two people in my network that use Snapchat, and it's my 20-year-old brother and someone else that I know fakely that probably does the same thing as I do in trying to see what is Snapchat all about. Um, but because I only have two people, I don't have a lot of snaps to send to people, right? Because, yeah, who are you going to send it to? Those two people. Suddenly these two people become your new best friends. <laughs> because you're trying, you're trying out new things. But you don't have a lot of people to, to, um, to engage with. And, and I think that is sort of the core of what we call network effects. A value of a network increases the moment you have more users. So if my mobile phone allows me to call everybody, it has a lot of use. If I can only call people that are on the same network, it's a lot more difficult. And we call that network effect. And what you see is that a lot of the big platforms are using network effects not just because it's more convenient for users, but also to become dominant. So for instance, if you want to go to a party as a student and you want to be invited to really nice parties, you have to be on Facebook. It's almost impossible to stay up to date if you're not on Facebook. It's the same like if you want to stay in contact with a lot of your friends. Apparently now Snapchat is the, is, the, is the rage. But you all have to be on Snapchat. Because if you're not, then of course you would miss out half of the audience. And then people go somewhere else. And these network effects are very normal. It's, sort of a, it's almost an economic law. But it means as a company that they can play with that. And if you look at sort of... If you combine the first two points. So if you combine sort of that empowered user that has a lot of choice... They can access a lot of information at the time of their choosing, but they also want to be connected to each other. Um, and they want to have a place, perhaps, where everything comes together. Because it's nice that if I want to see video, that I can Google it. But it's nice that it's in one place most of the time. So what you see, that's sort of the third point that I wanted to raise, is that actually you see an incredible rise of a few centralized platforms in most media industries. Um, and I think that is sort of the irony, because on the one hand, we see that people want to have choice and a lot of options. Uh, on the other hand, they say, well, if there's a platform that offers me all these different options, like YouTube does very smart, I think, because you have so much video on YouTube. So as a user, you can go there, you can find everything that you want, you just search it, and then you get the videos that you like, the music that you like. Apparently, most young people listen to music primarily on, on YouTube. But then you have these centralized platforms that then also connect different users. They know you, so they store data about you, so that they can even give you better recommendations, so they empower you more. But in the end, you see that basically we used to be dependent on a few large content creators, and now we see we're increasingly getting dependent on a few large platforms. And that raises, of course, a lot of questions, also ethical questions. I know in Germany there was a whole debate about Apple um, not allowing certain companies to put apps in the App Store because they didn't fit Apple's uh, criteria for being proper. 
So the debate in Germany was, can a company dictate actually what users can and cannot access? Do we want that? That was a big, big debate there. Um, so you see these centralized platforms, they have a lot of power, increasingly so. And it means that content creators have quite um, some difficulties nowadays uh, in making money. So you see that everywhere the squeeze on the content providers is getting bigger and bigger. And that means that the only way for them to survive in this platform world, in a world full of, cho uh, full of choice for consumers, is that they have to differentiate themselves. They have to be different. They have to do something that people actually take notice. So you can have a really strong brand, for instance. You see sort of also personality cults sometimes around authors or singers, etc. But you have to be different. I think Lady, I actually I should have had a picture of Lady Gaga here because she's of course very good at that. You go to an opening night of a sort of music festival, you wear a dress made of uh, meat, and then of course everybody will write about you and everybody knows who Lady Gaga is. It's very smart. Um, but you see that that differentiation, that that's sort of the really, really key point for, uh, for content. So if you get them all sort of together, so you have the connected, empowered users, um, that of course they want to be connected to all their friends so they go to networks and you have all these network effects and because of those two things you get all these centralized platforms that know who you are, they know your friends, they can give you recommendations based on who you are and what your friends like um, and if you are a content creator and you want to be noticed in an app store, you want to be noticed on, uh, on a platform, you have to make sure that you're different. You have to have something that, that makes you stand out. And I think from a more sort of uh, uh, human slash business perspective that these are sort of the main drivers at this moment that we see that is really changing media and, and, and adoption of, of new innovation. Uh, Peter Thiel, I don't know if people know that man, he uh, basically was one of the big investors in Silicon Valley. I think he invested in LinkedIn and in Facebook and in a few others. And he just wrote a book where he's also really talking about network effects amongst other things. And, and uh, I highly recommend it, but anyway. So um, we have these changes in, in, in media and these drivers of change in media. I will, at the end of this part, I will come back to that. So I'm, I'm gonna tie the two in. The second part, I wanted to talk a little bit about changes in education. Um, I did a lot of work on education for the European Commission. So we did a lot of studies on the future of learning and looking at sort of where things were heading, uh, interviewing hundreds of people all over Europe, all over the world actually, to see what, what they thought. And there were a few conclusions that I'd like to uh, share with you. One of them, of course, and that's not a surprise, um, is that we already, for the last 20 years, I think, uh, in academic circles, had all these huge hopes for changing education, making education relevant and accessible and access to information available. And what we see now is that technology is becoming so mature in the education domain that it is an enabler for innovation in how we learn. And we're actually finally, I think, getting to that stage. Um, a really nice uh, example of that is, I don't know if people ever heard of Iversity. It's a platform, I think they're based in Berlin. Um, there are also some big American platforms that, that offer these things, but it's a so-called massive online open course. And basically what they do is that they have university courses that they offer for free, so you can register. And then you can follow it online, you can collaborate with other people. And one of the things why I really like Iversity as a platform is that they really make it in terms of how it looks and feels. They really have the user interface. Uh, uh, I think they, they nailed it, basically. I think they did that really well, because some of the other platforms, I think they're still a little bit too much for tech people, I always think, if you see how it, how it functions. Um, but it's a super interesting platform, and I, I love, um, I, I, I hardly ever say that about politicians, but I'm a big fan of our Minister of Education. We used to have a lot of ministers for education in Holland that didn't have an education background, and this is someone who really gets it. And one of the things that she said, and this already a year ago, she said that students in the Netherlands uh, at the universities that do a massive online open course somewhere else, of course, it needs to be a certain type of university that is sort of uh, also accredited. They can get study points for doing that. So if you go online and you go, say, to Harvard or to, uh, uh, I don't know, British University or a French University, and you do a course in the comfort of your living room, 
you can go to your university and say, hey, I did this course, can I get study points? Iversity is an interesting example because they actually give ECTS, which is the European standard for credits for higher education. So um, you can just get ECTS. And we already had at universities that discussion because a lot of students were coming to us and said like, oh, I did all these things. Why am I not rewarded for this? Why should I do the same course at this university if I already did it online? Well, in the Dutch system, uh, universities get paid for awarding study points. So uh, that's sort of their financial model. So of course, for a lot of universities, they were really like, oh, that suddenly means that if someone perhaps has 20% somewhere else, we also get 20% less money. So now they're investing a lot in developing their own online courses. But you see that these changes are going quite, uh, quite rapidly, which is, uh, which is interesting. So what you see in, in education, and I think that is step one, and it's a bit the same as what we saw before with, with media in general, I think the user is increasingly taking center stage. The user is becoming, because the thing is, if you think about learning, we've created sort of learning factories where the system was in charge and you have to fit in that system and then you just follow a certain type of education for eight years in primary school and then six years in secondary school and then four years in university. And we see now that the user is taking a more and more important role. So we see what we call personalization of what and how we learn. And this is uh, 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 an image from uh, a presentation, a TED talk of one of the founders of Coursera, which is the largest platform for massive online open courses. And basically how she explained it, and I thought it was quite interesting, she said like, normally at a university you have a 10 week course or an eight week course, and you have to do the course, because that's the program. And you have to do a course and then you get credits. She said, well, if we take a course like genetics, which is, uh, of course, in some circles, a really important course. You say, some people just want a refresher. Just give me the basics. I don't want to know everything about genetics. Just give me the basics. Some people say, well, I already know the basics. I just want the modern stuff. What is happening right now? You know, what is sort of the important thing that I have to know, the latest state of research, etc." And some people who work in companies say, I really don't care about all the theories and all those things. I just need to know about commercial genetics. So how can we apply it? And what do I have to know uh, if I want to work in this industry or if I work in this industry? So she said, and this is for them to start, she said, like, we are going to look at educational content and we're going to turn it into all these little modules. And then we're going to look at what users need and then see if we can connect these modules to users. It might very well be that a user needs only the basic genetics and a little bit of biology from another course. And if you combine that, that might, for that user, be a much more relevant package than something that a teacher thought would be the relevant package for everybody. And that's a totally different way of thinking. Um, that is, well, I think now uh, becoming increasingly uh, a common good, especially in higher education, but in this country also for uh, primary and secondary education, personalization is sort of becoming a norm that's going to be adopted also by the government and the school councils, which is quite, uh, quite interesting and good, I think. Um, because the nice thing is we always said we want to make uh, education relevant for everybody and personalization of education is not necessarily a new concept but what we see now is that technology enables us to do it so if you have a company like Newton I don't know if anybody ever heard of them they are really um, it's a really big company and basically what they do is they scan uh, content and then they see how can we divide that content into all these little different modules and how can we then tie that into what a user wants so they can help you to personalize learning. And they are a partner, for instance, for a lot of publishers. Um, and they also raise a lot of money. If you look at sort of Silicon Valley at the moment where they're putting their money in, education is huge and personalization of education is on top of it. And uh, for instance, this is a one round where they raised $51 million uh, for personalized learning. And uh, one of the things that they say is that um, they say like they're a education technology company to personalize digital courses so every student is engaged and no one slips through the cracks. Of course, this is marketing, so this is from their website, so you have to, of course, be a little bit critical about this. But the whole idea behind it is that, of course, we have always thought of education as a one-size-fits-all program. So if you study law, you get four years of law, of course, you can have some electives and you can do a minor program.
but it's not really much focused on a single person or how someone learns. So, for instance, with my students, how I teach is how they get it. That's sort of it. But it might very well be that some students are much more uh, um, interested in other ways of learning, perhaps online, or they want to read things, or they want to do things in very active participation. So that's something that with that personalization, that that is uh, sort of a dream in education that perhaps is coming true in the coming years. And it's a bit what Netflix does for TV, of course, eh? because I always get these recommendations from Netflix and I think, well, would I like it? Most of them actually I like, to my surprise. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, that's quite good. Um, also what we see, of course, is a lot of social learning. And social learning, on the one hand, this is a course that I did at MIT, uh, again, online for free. So I wasn't in Boston all the time. Uh, but it's about uh, teaching creative teaching. So sort of how can I, you put more creativity in, in your teaching? And what we did is that we worked a lot online and we talked with a lot of different people on these online platforms about everything that we were dealing with. But we also had a small group. So they connected like 15 to 20 of us. And if you look at the, the screenshots on the right, uh, that is of Google Plus, the mobile app, and we were just discussing that. So I was just sitting in the train back home, you know, when I gave a lecture, sitting in the train and talking to other people about, hey, what did you think of the article? I thought it was really cool, or etc. And that sort of form of social learning is also very important and very interesting, I think. And what you see is also what a lot of people say uh, nowadays is that the social learning can be active. I can basically just talk to you and we can have a great conversation about an article. Um, that's one thing, but I can also use the data of all these people and see, hey, can I also draw some lessons from that data? And if I sort of understand who you are as a system, I can also think, well, perhaps there are a thousand people in our network that are exactly like you. So let's see what they did. How did they pursue their knowledge quest? And how did they get their information? And then we can basically give you all these recommendations. So that's a little bit implicit social learning, data-driven, which is uh, becoming incredibly uh, important. And of course, that's one of the things that a lot of people like, is that learning is becoming more active. And not just, this is an example from an, from an online platform where you can play games to learn how to do math. This is uh, a website called SumDog, which is very popular in the US, uh, that has a lot of games particularly focused on girls and getting girls to like uh, mathematics. Um, and they play all these games and you can connect to your friends and you can share high scores, etc. Um, but of course, you also see that learning isn't just, because that's one thing I like to stress, it's not just all going to be technology. Uh, learning is also a lot about playing and doing things in the real world. And that's something that is still uh, very important. So we take the user center stage. And what we also do is then increasingly, we're starting to use the context of users. Um, because just a quick question, if a show of hands, if a mother would read a bedtime story to her daughter, is that learning? You think it's learning? Yeah? Yeah. So that's sort of everybody more or less agrees. Okay, that's good. And if someone plays Minecraft, a super popular Swedish game, um, is that learning? Yeah? Sort of? Depends what you do probably, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because there are even teachers that are using Minecraft. I think there's an education um, uh, part of it even. So this is also learning. Um, I don't know if uh, people here ever heard of Sukata Mitra. It's really fantastic to look at his TED talk. I'm really a big fan of this guy. Basically, one of the things that he did is he uh, basically said, I am, uh, or oh, I, a good example, he went to Italy. He doesn't speak a word of Italian. So he stood in front of a class of Italian children at a school, and he basically asked them, what did Pythagoras find out? In English, he wrote it on the board. He said, bye, see you tomorrow, and he left. And the only thing that they did is give these kids access to the internet. So what these kids did were like, hmm, we don't speak English. I don't know, it's a strange Greek looking name, no idea what to do. So they started, like, hey, I think on the internet you can translate things, right? And then they translated it and within 15 minutes everybody had the right answer and the next day he came back and they could explain to him what Pythagoras had found out. He did a similar experiment that goes a bit further in India where he basically created a wall and in the wall there were computer screens and there, were, there was a mouse and a keyboard and they put it in villages, they called it the hole in the wall project. And um, 
There were a lot of children there, some of them couldn't even read or write because they didn't go to school, but a lot of children that never used a computer before. And he just said, I'm just going to see what happens if I put a computer there. I'm not going to teach them how to use it, I'm not going to do anything. And before you knew it, you know, initially they were scared. After a few days, you know, there were some that were trying to do it. And then you saw that people actually started to use the computer, understand how it works, and in the end they actually um, could use it. And they were teaching each other how to use it. So you see that if you give people the tools, they will use them to learn themselves, which I find quite inspirational because we always tend to think we have to think out everything for people. And one of the things, and this, this is still what baffling me, that, that, that baffles me until today, especially if you talk to government, is that we know, and there's so much research, that learning is everywhere. More than 50% of a child's language development is... Uh, um, part is, is sort of being caused by his home situation, not school. So I think for the most part, teachers have perhaps 40% influence on the language development of children. But if you look at how we look at societies at learning, we say, oh, but we only facilitate it, so we only give money or we give tools um, to formal institutions. So what do you get if you know that the home, for instance, is super important for children's development? You get highly educated parents with money that buy things for their children, so their children actually achieve more, whereas people perhaps that have less money or have less education themselves, of course, then cannot do the same. So you get the self-fulfilling prophecy of people sort of being trapped in their social class, which is, I think, what most people don't want. So it's really interesting. And... Um, the European Commission calls this informalization of learning. There are a few programs also about this to really see can we also do more and give more tools to sort of the informal aspects of learning. So the user takes center stage. We're using the context of users more and more, the home situation. And this is one that I really love. I, I'm still not sure how we're going to do that ever at university, but I really hope we will at one point. It's what we call monitoring for learning. And... Um, I don't know if people ever had this feeling, like you did a test, I had it with statistics, I had to take the same course five times before I actually passed the thing. It was awful, I hated it, I really felt like a failure, it was really a yeah, sort of statistics nightmare, and now I use it all the time, funnily enough, in my research. <laughs> so you always see that in the end everything will work out. Um, but what I find, like the, the psychological effect, that if you do a test, and you fail the test, I, even the name, you fail the test, basically means like, oh, you don't meet the standard that we have. So you can re sit it, and then if you fail again, it's like, oh, you failed twice. Well, in a lot of universities, well, then you have to do the course next year. Sorry, you're just not one of the bright ones. And actually, we know from a lot of research that testing is primarily interesting as what we call a didactical instrument. So you can use a test to help people to learn better because failing in general is a good thing because if you fail, you learn. But the whole message that we give is like, oh, you don't pass a test, you failed, you are a failure. And that's, I think, what is wrong. And what we see with all these online tools, particularly with digital content, is that we can basically monitor people so rather than saying, I'm going to test you in May on how good you are in knowing everything about genetics, I'm basically going to monitor you all the time and I'm going to see over a period of three months how you're performing. And if I'm a teacher, and a lot of educational publishers already offer these packages, it's quite uh, common now in a lot, of, uh, a lot of schools to use that, they can actually see, oh, this child has really a lot of difficulties with this part of mathematics, and that child has a lot of difficulties with this part of mathematics, or with statistics, like, you know, the, the factor analysis. 80% of the students has a lot of difficulties with that. If I have to teach, it's really valuable information for me to know uh, what my students actually need. And here you see that you basically, if you monitor people, and people can demonstrate that they are, you know, increasing in their proficiency in something, um, then you have a whole different way of looking at their development. And you don't have that strange test moment, that one exam where everything needs to happen. And this is one little example, but what personally for me was an eye-opener with my students was that... Um, of course, they have their own Facebook groups, and I'm not allowed in, but I thought, hey, I can also play that game. I'm going to start Facebook groups with you, and you have to allow me in. Um, 
so they had a separate Facebook group as well. But basically, there were students uh, of, of the Media Entrepreneurship Program, international students, and they had to come up with like a new proposition and they had to build sort of a artificial company and do a lot of research for that. And one of the things for me was like, Normally what I do is I see them then once or twice a week, I talk to them and they hand in their products, I review their products, I give feedback and then they move on. Now I wanted them every day to report things on Facebook and have interaction with each other about what they were doing and what choices they were making. And for me as a teacher I could really follow their reasoning. So rather than seeing a final product, I could actually say after week two, why don't you look at this literature? Oh, that's a really interesting point. Why don't you do this? Have you thought of this? I also learned some things myself. But it's much more um, interesting also from a teacher's perspective to be able to see the process of children rather than the results of what they do, or students in this case. I can't call them children and become really angry. <laughs> Although some, some, some at university still call it school, which I always find really, uh, really interesting. Um, Anyway, and what you see is that a lot of these educational publishers, therefore, are monitoring, but also giving you sort of monitoring reports. This is a Dutch initiative which is really popular with parents called Skula, which is basically for homeschooling, but children can play a lot of games, and the games all work towards the goals that the government has set for primary education. Um, but parents can then see the results of what their children are doing and they're also asked to then support their children say wow well done even they have the grandparent support hotline there as well uh, which which works well um, but it is it is quite popular but these types of monitoring reports that they're also giving to school teachers is of course very interesting for the teachers as I said before because you can really see what children are and are not doing well and then you can help them with that so to sum it up, and this is also to, to make a bit of the relationship with what I said about media innovation, if you look sort of at the future learner, so if you take these kids for instance, um, of course they are super empowered because they have a lot of, a lot of information that they can use. Um, a lot of these new software packages are going to monitor what they're doing and based on that, basically what Netflix does as well for TV viewing, based on that they can personalize how they learn, what they learn and when they learn things. And they're hyper-connected. I mean, some people call them the digital native generation, but they're hyper-connected. They're always in touch with each other. There's even like if you Google or if you go to Twitter and you look at homework, housework in Dutch, uh, sort of around three, four o'clock, you basically see all these kids sharing homework assignment things with each other on Twitter, which is, I find, always nice to, um, to do. But what we see as well, we see the same thing happening in education, is that the content providers, the publishers, are having a hard time. But what we do see is that these big mix and match education platforms, these centralized platforms, that they are becoming more interesting. Because Coursera is the largest provider of massive online open courses. Um, they uh, only work with the top 100 universities, but Coursera is the brand. And of course I can do something with Yale, I can do something with another university. But Coursera, of course, is becoming a really important platform. So they are the ones that are exploiting the network effects. They are the ones that are capturing the data of the users and own the data. And they're also the one that says, this university is good enough to participate. So if you are with us, then you're good enough. And of course, that means that you as a platform have a very dominant position versus the content creators. Um, that have a slightly more difficult position. So what do they do? Again, they are differentiating themselves. So, um, for instance, uh, uh, what you see is that, for instance, branding is becoming super important. Um, some of the Dutch universities that I talked to, they said, like, we are developing online open courses only to make sure we won't sort of become this strange little provincial university that nobody knows. We have to be there now, so then we also build a brand that people recognize. Harvard, of course, is a great example of it. If you think business, you think Harvard, and one of their things that they want to do is they want to become, of course, the one sort of the standard for these online courses for business. You see a lot of media companies uh, moving towards the education domain because they have strong brands. So Discovery Channel, which is very big, they have Discovery Education. Disney has education. Some large magazine publishers that have like Donald Duck kind of things for children, they are moving into education because they can capitalize on the brand because the branding is so important. And 
the thing on the right, you probably won't uh, recognize it, but that is Kula, that Dutch uh, initiative that I just talked about with these games for children. What they do is that there's, a, a, an, there's an organization in Holland really famous for testing called CITO. And all the children when they're 12 have to do that test to determine where they go to in high school. And they say, we totally comply with CITO. CITO even took a stake in it. They also said, we are going to work together with the largest broadcasting company in the Netherlands, RTL Netherlands, which is owned by Bertelsmann, which is one of the largest TV companies in the world, because they can give us advertising space to build our brands. So you see that actually all these things that are happening in media are basically also happening here. So that just gives me room for some thoughts for archives, and now it becomes tricky because you're much more an expert than I am. <laughs> um, but the question that I have, and I don't know, perhaps in some countries it is happening, but the main thing that popped into my mind when I started to think about it, because I thought, oh, you have YouTube, you have Facebook, you have all these platforms that basically aggregate data and are becoming more important. I was like, why aren't archives these platforms? That was really a question that I had, because basically, the big thing about having a platform like that, you have a user interface, but the difficulty is, of course, in the backbone, the database, how do you store content, how do you make sure that if two million people want to stream a video, that that's still there. I was really wondering that, because I was thinking about the Rijksmuseum, the big museum here in, in Amsterdam, and they have uh, digitized their whole collection. Um, so they have uh, made really high resolution images of every work of art that they have. And it's available for free because they say, well, the Dutch citizens pay for us, so we're, that's sort of uh, how we're gonna give it back. And they developed, you can have Nike shoes with paintings from them on it, or you can even say, oh, I'm gonna download something because I love it and make a picture and hang it in my house, or you can do whatever you wanna do with it. You can change it, you can make a new work of art based on something that they have. So there's sort of a platform for sort of Dutch art. And I think nowadays it's just their collection. I would hope that they would open it up for everybody who does something with art. Be um, so logical I, for archives to become these platforms. And of course they're thematic, so I could imagine you would have something around a certain theme that is important to users or just video. But it was just something that I wondered. And perhaps, I don't know, we have a little room in a minute for um, questions. So perhaps someone can, can help me answer that question. So I actually ask you a question rather than the other way around. But anyway, let's go wild. Um, I think it's also really important to think about network effects and, and, and start to embrace them. So even if you see that Google is, uh, uh, of course, the owner of YouTube, is competing with Facebook, is competing with Apple, with a lot of others, they still allow you to share everything because they want to become the central entity in the network, the central node in the network because these network effects are so important. By the way, it's this Gangnam style. I was really amazed over 2 billion views, 2.1 billion views. But A third thing, I think, if you decide to become a platform, I think it's really important for content owners to be able to thrive. Uh, this is an image from Spotify that says how much royalties they pay out. It's important to think about like how can I help people to make money or generate another objective if we are a platform. Because that's sometimes what people tend to forget. And then, of course, the copyright owners then think, yeah, why should I bother? Because uh, I'm just going to give away things for free. And the last thing is, if you cannot be a platform yourself, I think if you cannot beat them, join them. Um, I noticed it, as I said before, with my students. If an article cannot be found on Google Scholar, there's a large chance that they won't read it. I know it's awful, but it's true. But it's a song. <laughs> I said that it's suddenly I think like, oh, it's actually saying a song. Um, but therefore, you have to be on those platforms where the users are. So I know there are a lot of copyright issues always, and it surprises me, for instance, with public broadcasters that they don't use these platforms much more because basically it's where your users are. The only thing that you have to do is make sure you brand yourself well. So if you can't beat them, join them. Um, so I hope these, uh, these made sense. And I think what is worthwhile to point out, I think time is ticking because if you look at YouTube, YouTube, of course, is also an audiovisual archive. And the longer they're running the show, the more and more dominant they're becoming. And I think that is also for other archive functions. So I think in that sense, it's, it's a little bit uh, a situation of innovate or perish. Um, so I hope that made sense, but um, thank you very much for your attention. And I don't know if there's room for questions. Yeah.
room, if there's room for questions, is there anyone in the audience who needs to, who wants to comment on this or maybe ask a question or maybe answer the question that he's asked during the presentation? Anyone? I can't see any hands. So is it good or a bad sign? Yeah, it's, it's always it's always tricky, isn't it? That, yeah. Okay. Well, perhaps a question. But I, if you if you go back to this question, is is um, is there a platform here? Perhaps is there an archive here that is sort of a dominant platform in their country? Yeah. Well, not necessarily a website, but also a platform that allows, for instance, others to like what YouTube does, that allows others to put information on it. So, like an aggregation platform, almost. Commenting, but also, um, let's say that you are um, uh, in country X, like YouTube, for instance. Huh? YouTube allows all the broadcasters to upload their material there. So, they become a platform. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I think we have a difficulty here. Um, when it comes to national archives, for them, it could be easier to build a platform. If you are a broadcasting archive, you are within the broadcasting company. And the broadcasting company itself has limitations in rights to what to produce and publish. And, and, and then it becomes a much bigger question because it can't be the archive's platform. It has to be the company's platform. And that is maybe one little tricky thing when we talk about this. But of course, broadcasters can think of the future to be, to be this thought of thematic uh, platforms. And I think that, in a way, they are doing that to find their new roles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can I say something to that as yeah. well? That's why we in the Netherlands have an, uh, an open platform that's called Open Images. Um, free, um, uh, rights-free uh, material that is put online that can be used by anyone, actually. Um, people can upload material as well. And the good thing about that is that it's used by Wikipedia, for example. So a lot of, let's say, audiovisual uh, support at Wikipedia comes from that platform. It's called Open Images. But again, Evelise is right. It's all about the rights here. So this is yeah. uh, um, right-free material that we can put online. Yeah. Yeah. But it works. Yeah, the, the rights issue, of course, I know that is, a, that is a really big issue. The question, but that's more like from an economic point of view, I always wonder if the right owners are making money now anyway with that content in the archives. Because it's like, yeah. Yes, they, are. they are? Okay, that's good. Okay. Uh, I can think of two things. Uh, Europeana, for example, which is a European yeah. uh, site and platform where different countries put up their contents and within that there is the U EU screen itself for images, moving images. And the other thing is in Denmark we have joint, uh, I think it's about 11 cultural institutions have uh, come together to um, create a platform where uh, images and text are put up as a joint venture. Okay. Uh, so there are examples out there, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and do you, are you also working on Europeana yourself, or...? Well, we, I work for the Danish Broadcasting okay. Corporation, and we are a partner in the, the yeah. EU Screen Excel. Yeah. So we upload uh, a certain amount of uh, images yeah. and audio, and also metadata okay. is... Uh, and what is your experience? Is it a positive experience for you to do it on a European scale? Uh, well, I think uh, it's an interesting, when we talk about impact, uh, because there's so many um, attempts both to join together, uh, but also I think each cultural institution nowadays would like to do their own website and uh, everybody uh, hire people with communication and uh, website yeah. skills. Yeah. So there is a, also a, a competition um, within ourselves, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that speaks very well into what you're talking about, that you know, somehow we're all trying to find uh, that place where we can differ yeah. because it's, the competition is so tough. Yeah. So I think we, in some way we compete with ourselves with all these different initiatives. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I think it's also a way of exploring and... Uh, and uh, using that innovative side that you're talking about, not getting the bright idea, but actually try to imp implement 
yeah. and make an impact of uh, all this content that we have. So, okay, very very interesting. Thank you. Are there, oh, oh we dear. <laughs> we keep you busy, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's a slippery floor as well. Yes, uh, thank you. I come from uh, Ina in France. So two two comments. First, uh, through putting our own contents online and having a, a very large website for that. Progressively, we became an aggregator for other contents with a selection process. It's not an open uh, environment. However, I just wanted to comment on another issue, which is, for example, putting our contents with a professional contract on YouTube in exchange of funding. Yeah. And that is a real opportunity open to archives. We yeah. put 50,000 documents on YouTube. And, and it's an important revenue source. It doesn't cover our costs, but it is interesting as, a, as an issue. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. Um, I remember talking to people from Talpa, which is a Dutch TV producer, and they create The Voice. Most people probably know that show. Um, and they also have a deal that even users can upload material from The Voice because there are so many fans, etc. But then the, uh, the revenues coming from the advertisements are split. Which is a great thing, because if you have other people working with your material, they upload it and you still, you know, you can find it and, and you still get some revenue for that. So I think that's a great comment. Thank you. There's room for one more question or comment. I thought, Britt. Yeah. It's just a little comment, really. I think, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head in a way. On the one hand, we can, as archives, I'm from the Irish broadcaster and similar to Evelise, inside the broadcaster, much more difficult to be innovative out there. But I think the, the YouTube idea and getting funding back, I mean, who do you want to contact? Who do you want to network with? Where do you want to make your impact is the key. Is it between ourselves? Or do we want, is it, the, is it the academic community? Is it the public? So for broadcasters, we're always trying to engage with our audience. Yeah. And for the archives within that, we're looking for that audience too. Yeah. So I think the idea, we, we know where they go to look for us. They don't come to our websites, they go to YouTube. And it's been a bit of the elephant in the room. None of us have quite known how to approach it. Yeah. So I think we just need to think harder and figure out, is there a way yeah. that we can really capitalize on somebody that has already built a huge network yeah. and where people are already going? So that's yeah. my thought for the day. Yeah. No, but I think that's a really interesting point. But I think if, if you talk about public broadcasters and, and their role in society, so to have like a societal impact, I think it's really important that they always at least in most countries, had a mandate to have a diversity of opinions, to cater for all groups in society, but also to you know, uh, make society coherent and provide independent news. The question is, uh, and, and that's a question now in the new um, uh, media policy in Holland that's being hotly debated, is whether you are the producer of everything or you become also partly a facilitator of others that might have a great opinion. But perhaps, you know, the, the independent production companies, that can also be even a user. But that's, of course, a big question uh, that politics have to solve as well. So, uh, yeah, with great comment. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Matthijs. I think we can dedicate an entire conference. Yeah, round okay. of applause. Thank you. Well, this is a little token of appreciation for your contribution to the conference. Oh, great. I love and, that. Well, it's going to be tricky with the microphone and... Uh, well, hey, I, I multitask, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, and, thank you. Um, thanks again. Okay, thank you. Uh,